Sometimes you have to encourage yourself. Sometimes you have to speak victory during the test. No matter how you feel, you can speak a word and you will be healed. Speak over yourself and encourage yourself in the Lord. Sometimes you have to speak a word over yourself. Pressure is all But remember, giants, they do fall. Speak over yourself and courage yourself in the Lord. As I minister to you, oh, I minister to myself. You feel like there is nothing left. Oh, the enemy, he creates these walls. But remember, giants, they do fall. Speak over yourself. Hello, good morning, my name is David, and I want to welcome you to Good Shepherd this morning. God has brought you here, so pour out your heart and let it be filled with the peace and wonder of Christ. This morning, however you're coming in, if you're coming in with lots of joy and lots of hope, you're welcome here. This morning, if you're coming in with lots of anger or confusion or frustration, you are welcome here. All are welcome at the table of God. And this morning, we come together um, and we're going to take a posture of humility and grace towards each other. It's God's kindness that lead us to repentance, which in scripture, the word metanoia is repentance. It's literally a reshaping of the mind. And we hope that in this season coming out of the election, kind of where we're at as a nation, that we all can take a moment to pause and think, how can I reshape my mind in the lens of Christ? How can I see my neighbor, my family members, my enemies? How can I see them through the lens of Christ and love them? So this morning, may these songs that we sing shape us, help shape our imagination to the ways of Christ. May the Spirit empower us to love with kindness and compassion. This is our worship. Let us sing together. The sun will rise, the sun will rise, bringing life to the earth as it springs from the ground. The sun will rise, 
the sun will rise, won't you dry all your tears? Lay a burden down, won't you dry all your tears? Lay a burden.
And now a reading from Psalm 78, verses 1 through 7. My people hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will teach you lessons from the past, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from our descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonder he has done. He decreed statues for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children, so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commandments. Glory to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, will be, and will forever be. Amen. Will we ever rise? Will we ever rise above the fear? Can we learn to see the need? Share humanity. I can see another day come. Broken people, we can be made whole. We can be made whole. We can be made whole. As we lay down our weapons, open up our hearts. Love is breaking us, love remaking us. Will we ever rise? Will we ever rise above the pain?
All are welcome at the table of God. Every man, woman, and child. For Christ brings peace to all, tearing down every hostile wall. So that the many may become one. One heart. One family. One new humanity. For God who is love. And Christ who is all and in all. Show no partiality and make no distinction. So neither race nor class. Gender nor sexuality politics, nor religion, personality, nor nationality, count for us or against us. The light of Christ enlightens all. Christ the prisoner and the naked. Christ the hungry and the sick. Christ the thirsty and the stranger. Christ the other. May God's spirit hover over our chaos, our hatred and indifference, descend in our hearts with love and pleasure, Blow us out into the world to listen and to serve. And set us ablaze to forgive and reconcile. For we are all welcome at the table of God. Every man, woman, and child. Amen.
trouble. The water. Come on, Charles, sing it. Way in the water. say our generosity liturgy together. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We bring nothing into this world, and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord devote ourselves to resisting greed, which plunges the human heart into ruin and pierces it with many griefs. We are determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds and willing to share all that we have, laying up for ourselves treasure that will not decay, but will shine in the age to come. May this be true of our community. And now it's time for grace and peace. So if you would reach out to whoever is with you or reach out through text or um, a quick message, to those in your life to say grace and peace. Grace and peace to you. And now a reading from Matthew 25, 1 through 13. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five of them were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning once again. If you're joining us for the first time, my name is Michael Redzina. I'm one of the pastors here, and I hope that you feel welcomed. I hope that you feel a space to explore and to experiment with the teachings and the story of Jesus in the context of these digital gatherings and also the context of our community. It's been a very hard week for all of us. At the same time of this sermon, the outcome of our national election is still pending. I hope by the time that you're watching this that we have a bit more clarity. But the truth is, the stress and the waiting, the anxiety of how people are responding in the midst of this waiting, it's been emotionally draining for me. And I've heard from many of you that you feel similarly. We've already heard our gospel story this morning, and so I invite you into a much-needed moment of quiet to recenter our hearts, 
in God's presence and in God's love, to come honestly and openly as we really think and feel, with our faith and our doubt, with our joy and our sadness, with our love and our anger, with our fear and our hope. Or however we arrive in this moment, let's open our hearts to the possibility that God could connect this story we've just read to ours in a powerful way. So a quiet moment now, as best as you know how. God of mercy, we open ourselves to you. We ask that you would fill our minds, that you'd fill our hearts with love and peace and with vision for the week ahead. And we pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, if you were to ask me to select a story from the Bible for a day like today, the story of the 10 virgins would not be my number one choice. It probably wouldn't even make my list. But that's why I love the lectionary. It stretches us to keep engaging even the far corners of the Bible with the expectation that there is treasure to be found all over the place, not just in our little handful of favorite texts. This parable, which Jesus tells here, it comes on the heels of his disciples getting swept up or caught up by the beauty and the spectacle of the temple. It's Jesus' final week. They look up to the temple and they say, look at these stones. But Jesus tempers their enthusiasm, not only asking them to sort of slow their roll on how much emphasis they put on a place like the temple, but he offers them a hot take. This temple will not last, right? And they will live to see its destruction, and those days will be very hard. So much of what follows this is helping his followers understand how to endure those difficult times, and also where to look for God's presence beyond the spectacle of brick and mortar, beyond the religious institutions and understandings that they have attached to so far in their journey. The story opens with 10 waiting women. Now, some translations call them virgins. Some translations call them bridesmaids. Both translations are hard because neither of these terms mean for us what they would have meant for them. It's best to simply understand these women as the bride's supporting cast, so to speak. They supported her as she waited, according to custom, to be visited by the groom, who would also have his own entourage, sort of yelling and singing and blowing horns throughout the town, announcing his soon arrival. Jesus says in his story, that these 10 women are waiting according to the custom and that five of them are wise and five of them were foolish. The wise women bring enough oil and the foolish don't. They all fall asleep, but when the moment of opportunity comes, only half of them are prepared and actually experience the celebration. The others who had to scramble to find oil, they missed the window of opportunity and the experience and the, the shut door is something that they're left to face. And they have the haunting words of the groom, I never knew you. Today, I'd like to highlight the power of opportunity, the nature of wisdom, and how this story could revolutionize our experience of a moment like we share right now in the United States of America. First, the power of opportunity. In Jesus' story, there's this window of opportunity, and it's clear that Jesus wants his followers to have a sense of urgency around this window of opportunity. But what is the opportunity exactly, and how long is this window? Now, some have read this to speak of the return of Christ or the afterlife. The opportunity is painted as going to heaven when you die or being in Christ's good graces after an expected end of time return. But there are a few clues in this text that lead many interpreters, including myself, to other conclusions, specifically that this urgent opportunity continues in our lives on earth right now. The first clue is in the mention of wisdom and foolishness. Right? These are themes that bring the Sermon on the Mount to a climax earlier in the gospel. This is Jesus' most famous and important set of teachings, which has practical calls to action. It ends like this in verse 24, chapter 7. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. 
The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, and yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. For Jesus, wisdom is not just hearing his words and teaching, but putting them into practice, and putting them into practice when times are hard. For Jesus, wisdom is an integration of words and deeds, of faith and of practice, and of ideas and habits. Now, what does Jesus invite us to practice? Well, the Sermon on the Mount, it's filled with concrete ways to show love to our neighbor as ourselves, and to connect that love to our spirituality. It's about life in the here and now, not some distant afterlife scenario or a second coming. See, Jesus is passionate about people growing in love on earth as it is in heaven. Now, the second clue is the phrase, I never knew you. We will hear at the end uh, of this chapter a similar phrase in another parable. It's a parable that gives us God's golden standard for judgment, and it doesn't hinge on agreement with ideas or doctrines or with religious practice. It centers on how we treat our neighbor, specifically how we treat the most vulnerable among us, the prisoner, the hungry, the thirsty, the naked. You have one group that stands before God like the 10 women and calls out, Lord, Lord. And they are told, I never knew you. Why? Well, Jesus says, when I was naked, thirsty, and hungry, and in prison, you didn't care for me. They're perplexed, and they ask when this negligence took place, and they're told whenever they neglect the vulnerable, they neglect him. And then you have others who also call out, Lord, Lord, and they're perplexed by their welcome and by their acceptance. They're told that they helped Jesus when he was hungry, naked, thirsty, and in prison. And when they ask for examples of their care, he says, whenever you did this to the least of these, you've done it for me. So there we have it. Right? The features of this parable point us to the urgency of this window of opportunity in this life, in this world, in a time of great challenge and violence and conflict. And where does this opportunity lie? Now, when does the groom arrive, so to speak, in our lives? Well, it turns out the opportunity is wide open every single day. Right? Every encounter with another human being is a potential divine encounter. Every time we show kindness, every time we show dignity and we listen, every time that we're patient, every time we speak a difficult truth in love, every time we forgive, every time we learn rather than teach, we encounter Christ. And we encounter him through the other. The image of oil here is also extremely rich. You know, some interpret it as the Holy Spirit of God, empowering us, fueling us, if you would, to love and to listen and to serve, as our unity prayer says. And there are two interesting things about the Holy Spirit for a time like now. First of all, the Spirit's always pointing people to show love and inclusion beyond their tribe and beyond their understanding. In the Gospels, Jesus included the rejected. He welcomes the dejected and the shamed. In the story of Acts, which is the account of Jesus' followers after his departure, we see that same Holy Spirit that led Christ, leading his disciples, to learn to overcome racial and social bias, uh, to learn to overcome prejudice, to include, to welcome and share a table just as Christ did. And another interesting thing for our time is how the Holy Spirit is up to something beyond our tribe and beyond our understanding, especially the understanding of his disciples. Um, the Holy Spirit is active even before the disciples arrive to a place. You know, we who know and love God, we don't bring God with us. God is already there and active in people's lives. We simply need to be awake and alert and have eyes that are open to see where and how God is at work so that we can have the urgency not to presume and actually miss it. How might God be showing up in the world right now in the midst of our conflict? How might God be showing up in the midst of your world right now? This week, as you have encounter after encounter, I'd like you to imagine your heart as one of those lamps, 
And imagine the oil as the fuel of God's Spirit prompting you to shine forth with love and with receptivity. Our country needs people who feel the urgency to put Jesus' teaching into practice, who are awake to the presence of God in our neighbor, in the stranger, and yes, even in our enemy. We need an openness to the possibilities of a world that we might otherwise be tempted to write off as just evil and toxic, tempted to do it in the name of God even. Jesus is saying that isn't wisdom. Just like Jesus, we're called to be light, to bring light, and to receive light in the midst of darkness, not escaping the darkness. May God give us courage to face the darkness of hate and of chaos and to face every person that we meet this week with the light of God's unconditional, everlasting, and unfailing love. Amen. And now that we've reflected on the gospel text, we take a moment to declare our faith. Today we say the Apostles' Creed, which is one of the earliest compressions of the Jesus story that we have. And we say it together as our tether, the thing that we ping off of with our lives, with our questions, with our faith and our doubt. And we do it together as a gesture of our shared journey in the story of Christ. Would you join me in this creed? We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He d descended into the, to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now having declared our faith, we offer our prayers. These are the prayers of the people written by and for the people for the sake of our world. Would you join your faith to these prayers? Join us in the prayers of the people. God, our creator, we pray for the church scattered around the world. Expand the opening of faith in our hearts. Give us the kind of love that always trusts, always protects, always hopes, and always perseveres. Stretch us that we would rejoice in the truth, whatever it may be, to run away from envy or boasting, and to put aside pride for the health of our minds and hearts and for the sake of our world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we pray for our country and its leaders. In a moment of waiting, in a moment of contested interpretation of what is actually happening, help us to resist the temptation to be mean or disrespectful. Help us to resist the temptation to reduce our neighbor to their political affiliation or outlook. Help us to be curious while passionate, patient while waiting, and hopeful in the face of perceived evil. Draw us back to the process you reveal to us in Christ. The way of the Lamb, the vulnerable posture that doesn't simply mirror violence and ego, but resists it by fixing our eyes on the God who is love, who absorbs the chaos and who in the end offers forgiveness. May we look more and more like Christ through this cultural struggle. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who suffer right now, for those who continue to know the pain of the virus, who have lost loved ones, who have lost smell and taste, whose lungs and organs will never be the same. May your compassion and mercy be upon them. We pray for the hungry and the thirsty and the undersheltered as we approach the holiday season. In our feasting, may our generosity stretch to them. May we see them, be present to them, and offer our resources to bless and relieve them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now having offered our prayers, we take a moment for confession. Confession is simply taking responsibility for the ways that we fall short of love. So would you join me in an act of holy memory as we think to the week behind us and we ask the question, where have we fallen short of love? To do this, we ask for God's spirit to guide us, to 
to the memories that mean something, that matter for us, where we can observe in the kindness of God, where we can be vulnerable, and where we can pivot and change. Would you join me in this act of confession? Just a quiet moment to reflect on the week behind us. As you take this moment to reflect on the week behind you, there are memories that are emerging in all of our minds and hearts. And it can be overwhelming at times. And so we remember not only God's kindness toward us, but also the fact that we're not alone. And knowing that, we pray a corporate confession together. Would you join me in this corporate confession? Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we've done and by what we've left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we would delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And now, friends, hear the good news of Jesus Christ, that though we are sinners, we are loved, that though we fall short of love, God showers us with mercy. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love for you. As far as the east is from the west, so great and far has God removed our transgressions from us. You are loved, you are embraced, and you are forgiven in Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, having confessed our sins, we come to this table that we call Holy Communion. It's a table which speaks of the bonds of peace that God's Spirit is forging in the world. The, the, the bonds of peace that have been uh, shown to us and revealed to us through the life and this teaching of Christ. And so as we come to this table, we prepare our hearts with gratitude. That's why we call it Eucharist. It means thanksgiving. So would you join me in this ancient prayer? The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It's right to give thanks and praise. God, it is good and beautiful to say thank you. And so right now we pause to take stock of our lives and to attach to the good and the meaningful and the beautiful right now. Fill us with your joy as we review our lives and scan them for your goodness and beauty and glory. God, we thank you for the good gifts of creation and of your providence, but we especially thank you for Jesus Christ and the way that you're saving and healing humanity through him. We pray that right now, by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your word, that the cups and the bread that we hold before us would become to us and for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who on the night he was betrayed took bread and cup and blessed them. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we welcome you, risen Christ, into this moment, into our hearts afresh. We thank you for this body broken and given, and we pray that we would receive it afresh and that we ourselves would be willing to be broken and given for others. And likewise, Jesus took the cup, and after he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this cup is the cup of a new covenant in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we welcome you, risen Christ. We thank you for your life and your presence and your story alive in our own hearts and minds and community. We thank you for this new covenant, which reshapes how we think about friends and relationships and love. It stretches us beyond our tribes, even beyond our religious tribes, to see you and recognize you in the other. May this table draw us to that vision with increasing measure. Amen. And now, friends, we declare the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And these are God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. And now, friends, we invite you to receive Holy Communion. 
If you're wondering if this meal is for you, our uh, practice is an open table where anyone drawn to the love they see in Christ is welcome to come and to receive Holy Communion. Let this be the gesture of your open heart of faith in the God you see in Christ. Um, our practice is to take the bread and dip it in the cup and to simply say thanks be to God. If you plan to join us for our Eucharist on the lawn today, you don't have to, to receive communion at this time, uh, but for the rest of us, uh, we receive in faith and in love. Amen. And now, friends, we uh, want to thank you once again for joining Digital Church, Good Shepherd New York. Um, it really is an, a joy and an honor to share this journey with you, um, to be walking through the midst of a very chaotic time uh, through the lens of the story of Christ and through a community of faith. And so we invite you to continue to engage. You can go to our website, goodshepherdnewyork.com, to find out more about community groups, to find out ways that you can help or receive help. Uh, if you need prayer, if you have a tangible need in your life, uh, you can see events that are coming up, uh, whether it's our uh, Sunday Eucharist on the lawn or the Wednesday evening gatherings that we plan throughout the year uh, or special gatherings like the one that we had yesterday, uh, a trip to the Storm King Art Center. Um, we're so grateful uh, to be a part of this journey with you. We do want you to know that uh, we have an exciting announcement about a new album coming out uh, by our Good Shepherd Music Collective. Uh, it's an album that's called The Sun Will Rise. It features uh, original songs, sacred songs, uh, that have been uh, shown and recorded over the course of Digital Church. Uh, I know that a lot of these songs are some of your favorites. Uh, they're the ones that we continue to get emails about, so we're so excited about this album. Uh, it comes out November the 27th, and so uh, be on the lookout for uh, the links uh, both in our emails and on our social media where you can go and you can pre-save on Spotify or wherever you stream your music. Uh, we're excited to get this music in your hands and we're grateful to all of you who support uh, both through our Patreon program uh, and also through simply giving to Good Shepherd New York. So thank you to all of you uh, for your generosity, especially in the time of pandemic. And now receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. Go forth with joy and gratitude, celebrating all the many ways God has blessed you. May the Spirit give you courage, hope, grace, and love that we may bear these gifts to others. Go in peace. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Ooh, ooh, ooh.
Just like a hurricane, it keeps shaking me down, down. 